Hi guys. So I've got enough sleep that I think I can uh, create the second half of the video I promised you on Thursday, and I'm sorry for the delay. What I want to talk about today is how uh, an operator can be set up to have a representation um, where the matrix that represents it is a really special matrix called an upper triangular matrix. And to do so, I'm going to have to introduce um, a, an operator that's associated uh, with invariant subspaces, which is called a restriction operator. So let's we'll suppose that we have some operator T in LV. And let's suppose that we have U a subspace of V that is invariant under T. Remember what that means is that T applied to U puts you back into U again, okay? then um, we can define something called the restriction operator. Uh, T restricted to you, that's what that symbol means. So T restricted to you. Um, this turns out to be a linear map on the subspace. Uh, and we define it by T restricted to you of, of you is equal to t of u. So as long as I only input vectors from u, the outputs will also be in u. And so I can just use t to define an operator on the subspace. So this idea of cutting an operator down or restricting it to a smaller domain is part of the reason why we care about invariant subspaces at all. Okay. So this sort of naturally associated with subspaces. Okay, so with that idea, um, we're going to use restriction operators to talk about um, uh, matrices associated with operators. So let's actually look at, so because matrices associated with operators um, are from the same vector space into itself, and the dimensions will always be equal, this is going to turn out to be a square matrix. So let's look at the definition here, uh, matrix of an operator. This is definition 5.22, if you're curious. Um, so if we suppose T is in L of V and uh, V1 through Vn is a basis of V. Then um, the matrix of T is N by N matrix. Um, where M of T is equal to A11, A1N, AN1, ANN, where like before, I mean, there's nothing about this definition that's different than what we were doing before. Um, where do the coefficients come from? The coefficients come from looking at what T does to each basis vector. So where T of VK is equal to A1K V1 out to ANK VK or um, VN. And so again, the idea here is that these coefficients form the column of the matrix associated with the, the VK element. Okay. Um, you might sometimes see the notation. Um, we haven't really involved the idea. We've noted several times that the basis that you choose matters. There's actually a notation for this where um, if I need to specify which particular basis is being used, um, I can use the notation M, T, comma, and then give you the particular basis that we use to construct that matrix. So this specifies the basis used for V. As we've noted, the matrix will change if the um, um, if the basis changes. Okay, so now we're going to define what it means to be upper triangular. And the first thing I need to do is tell you what the diagonal of a matrix is. So um, the diagonal of a matrix um, is the entries. Uh, AII, 
where i goes from one up to n. So that is, it's the entries starting in the upper left-hand corner and going to the lower right. So you can imagine here that like, if you have a matrix, A11, A12, A1n, A21, A22, A2n, down to An1 and over to Ann, the diagonal is these entries. This is the diagonal. Sometimes you might see this called the main diagonal. And then there's occasionally uh, you, you want to refer to the what's called the off diagonal, which is the diagonal going in the other direction. But when I actually says diagonal, this is what he means. The set of elements starting in the upper left and going to the lower right. And of course, this only makes sense for a square matrix. And then finally, we're ready to talk about what it means to be upper triangular. So a matrix is upper triangular if every entry below the diagonal is zero. Now notice that doesn't tell me anything about the uh, entries on the diagonal, just below the diagonal. Um, so for example, um, this is an upper triangular matrix. One, two, three, zero, zero, two, zero, zero, one. And it's upper triangular because if you look at the diagonal, every entry that's below the diagonal was a zero. Okay. And um, oftentimes we have a special notation where I don't write zeros a bunch of times here, and maybe I don't even care what's above the diagonal. And so um, you, you'll see the notation, something like this, lambda one down to lambda n, and the star up here to represent the fact that there might be entries up there that are non-zero, and then a zero over here. So it's sort of like a block notation where you have to imagine that, that what that zero represents is lots of zeros under the diagonal. And this is supposed to represent arbitrary elements above. And again, notice that I can't say anything about what's actually on the diagonal, right? Zero, non zero. <coughs> so upper triangular matrices are useful because um, they're significantly easier to compute with than. Um, um, more complicated matrices where there are not zeros below the diagonal. Um, they're not the simplest matrices to work with, but you can imagine that when you're doing computations, the more zeros you have in the matrix, the easier it's going to be because multiplications are going to be much simpler. And so are inversions, if inversions are possible. So the goal that we have, one of our goals is to be able to take an operator and write it with an upper triangular matrix. So we want to take an operator and write it in upper triangular form when that's possible to do. And so the first big theorem of this section is, is saying um, uh, when you can do that. Okay. So here's our theorem. This is theorem 5.26. And it says the following. Suppose you have um, T in L of V, so you've got an operator and a basis V1 to Vn of V. Um, then the following are equivalent, TFAE. So any one of these conditions will imply the rest of them. A, um, the matrix of T with respect to the basis V1 up to Vn is upper triangular. B, T, V, J is in the span of V1 up to V, J for each J is equal to one up to N. So what that means is any basis vector you pick, if you apply T to it, the thing that comes out is in the, is in the span of that V, J and every element that came prior. 
can see the span of V1 up to Vj is invariant under T from each J one to N. Okay, so the fact that invariant subspaces are involved should tell you that um, at some point we're gonna be, be able to get eigenvalues and eigenvectors into the mix here. Um, what this suggests is that the proof of this uh, is going to involve carefully arranging a basis uh, so that we get this sort of stack spanning feature. So what I mean by that is you can think that the idea, um, the idea of this is um, uh, we're going to want to say, okay, well, can we set this up so that TV1 is in the span of V1? Well, that's going to be uh, easy to do if you have invariants. Um, and then we want to be able to show that TV2 is in the span of V1, V2, and so on. And if I can do that all the way up to TVN is in the span of V1 up to VN, then I'll have proof condition B, right? This is sort of the idea here. This is what I mean by sort of stacked. Um, uh, stacked spans or stacked invariants. Okay, so let's actually look at the formal uh, proof of this. Um, okay, so the equivalence of A and B uh, acts or leaves this to the reader. But it's pretty easy to see what's going on if you think about what it means for a matrix to have this kind of representation. So if you think about the matrix of T as having this form, so A11, and then zeros underneath it, and then the next one is going to be A12, A22, and zeros underneath it, and so on. If you keep in mind that this is the column that represents T applied to V1, and this is uh, you know V1 all the way down here, uh, V2 and V2, you can read off that the span stretch. I mean, the fact that we have an upper triangular matrix is going to force that spanning condition to hold, um, and in, in both directions. The idea here is that what this tells you is that T of V1 is equal to A11 V1 and a whole bunch of zeros. And then T V2 is going to be equal to A12 V1 plus A22 V2 and then a whole bunch of zeros. But this is precisely the statement that um, V1, that T V1 is in the span of just V1. And this is the statement that T V2 is in the span of V1 and V2. So the structure of the matrix actually gives you um, exactly um, uh, the, the equivalence of A and B. Okay, so A implies B and B implies A are pretty easy to, to, to do. Um, um, C implies B is immediate. Um, so C implies B, well, if, if the span of V1 <laughs> up to Vj uh, is invariant under T, each j, then that means that t of vj is um, is in the span of v1 through vj. So vj is in the span of v1 through vj. That's invariant, so T takes VJ into the same space. But as soon as I say this, and that means that VJ, TVJ is equal to um, AJ1 of V1 up to AJJ of VJ, and then a whole bunch of zeros come after, which is you know exactly the, the same statement, um, which is to say the T is in that in, the, in that span. In fact, this line's not even necessary. That's a way of connecting it back to A again. Um, so A implies B and C implies B are, are pretty easy. So the map of, of what we got so far is that A implies B, A is equivalent to B, and also C implies B. And so really there's just one step left, which is to show that B implies C. So that's the hard part of this argument, if any part could be said to be hard. So um, let's suppose that B holds. So we're going to try to show that B implies C. So suppose 
that TVJ is in the span of V1 up to VJ um, for each J from 1 to N. Um, and then we're just going to do this, this stacked equivalence thing, right? So what we're going to say is, all right, um, so pick J. Um, certainly it's the case that uh, TV1, so what, what does B say? Well, B say says up to J, uh, each TVJ is in the span of the vectors leading up there. So if you pick a J, then TV1 is in the span of V1. Uh, which is contained in the span of V1 up to Vj. And Tv2 is in the span of V1, V2, which is contained in the span of V1 up to Vj. And we can do that all the way down to Tvj, which is in the span of V1 up to Vj, which of course is contained in the span of V1 up to Vj. Notice here when I'm using contained it in the way that Axer does, where he'll often leave off the subset equal sign. I don't mean these are proper subset. I mean, we have containment there, but it, it, it's, a, it's equality, right? So that we, we allow for um, uh, non proper containment with that symbol. Um, so what that means is uh, each of these guys is contained in the span of these. So any linear combination of those vectors, um, uh, if you take V, uh, which is equal to C1, V1, up to Cn, Vn, and you apply T to V, well, now you're going to get C1, T, V1, up to Cn, T, Vn. But each of these vectors is contained in the span of uh, v I to v, V1 to Vj, which means, of course, the, the linear combination is as well. So this is also in the span of V1 to Vj, because these vectors are all in the span of V1 to Vj, and it's a linear combination. Um, and that actually gives you that the span of V1 up to Vj. It's not, this is not supposed to be Vn right here, it's supposed to be Vj. Cj, Vj um, is invariant under T. And we picked J right here, but that was an arbitrary choice, which means that this holds, this holds for all J. And so this uh, lets you conclude that, so B implies C. Yeah. Okay, so a nice result. And that actually tells us something about, um, you know, so it tells us something really specific about the sort of basis that needs to exist in order for this to happen. So, now we're at the point of, uh, of asking, can I always do it? So if I have this sort of special kind of basis where um, the span of, you know, TV1 is in the span of V1, TV2 is in the span of V1 and V2 and so on. If I can construct that basis for any operator, then any operator would be, um, uh, every any operator would have a, a, an upper triangular matrix. It turns out to be the case that um, as long as you were working over the complex numbers, that you can do this. So this is sort of the big theorem of the section, um, which is theorem 5.27. And that theorem says uh, that we suppose V is finite dimensional complex vector space. Um, and let T be an operator on V. Then T has an upper triangular matrix. With respect to some basis. Of V. So the idea is that um, this is part of why operators are so useful. And this is one of the sort of core facts of linear algebra is that um, oftentimes in linear algebra to study things is to find the right basis for the vector space so that things become nice. And that's really what we want to do here. Um, 
is we want to show that there's a process for constructing a basis that guarantees that the matrix that come out uh, that comes out is nice to work with. Um, so this proof is going to use the existence of uh, of the restriction operator that we started with in the beginning. And then um, I'm going to do proof one. Axor actually provides two proofs, one using the restriction operator and then one using a different operator called the quotient operator. Um, this proof is going to run by induction. Um, it's not going to look like an induction that you saw in your 248 class necessarily, but um, the ideas are going to be the same. Um, uh, we're going to show that um, that the result holds uh, for a one-dimensional thing, and then we're going to assume that it holds for um, uh, uh, an n-dimensional or a whatever j-dimensional setting, and then we're going to imply that if it holds in a j-dimensional setting, it holds in the j-plus one-dimensional setting. Okay, all right. So here's the idea. So this is a proof by induction. And the way that we're gonna do the induction here is we're gonna pivot off of this right here. It, we're gonna induct on the dimension of the complex vector space. So let's start by um, like, you know, asking, is the theorem true by induction on the dimension of V. Uh, is the theorem true when the dimension of V is equal to one? And the answer is pretty clearly yes, because a one dimensional vector space has one vector in its basis. And the matrix of a vector space with one dimension is, is a one by one matrix, which is a scalar. Uh, which is automatically upper triangular because there's one element and it is the diagonal. So the answer here is yes, because for any T in L of V, the matrix of T is one by one, which looks like this. And there's only diagonal, uh, which is cheesily upper triangular. OK. Uh. OK, so let's actually see what he defines this to be here. So we're going to assume um, uh, assume, so for our sort of induction hypothesis, um, this is the, so again, this is not quite going to look like the sort of setup that you're used to, but the idea is that I'm going to say, suppose that I've got a vector space um, with some dimension, and I'm going to assume that the result holds for all subspaces of smaller size. That's our induction hypothesis. So the induction hypothesis is the following. Suppose um, the dimension of V is bigger than one and that the result holds for all uh, vector spaces of dimension smaller, strictly smaller than V. So what that means is if I'm on a, if I'm on a smaller a vector space of smaller dimension and I've got an operator on a vector space of a smaller dimension, then I can find an upper triangular matrix that does what I want it to do, right? Um, or I could find a basis to create that upper triangular matrix. So um, now we're gonna use eigenvalues. Maybe I should be more specific here. So if the dimension of E is bigger than one, um, that the result holds for all vector spaces of dimension smaller than me means that um, if the dimension of say U is smaller than the dimension of V 
and I have an operator T in L of U, then there exists a, a basis V1 up to Vm. Let's not use V for space U. There exists a basis U1 up to Um with the property that the matrix of uh, T with respect to that basis is upper triangular. Now, I don't know this holds for vector spaces of dimension V, but any previous dimension, I've, I've proved it. Okay, so there's our induction hypothesis. We'll be looking to invoke this. And the way we're going to invoke it is we're actually gonna to try to build a restriction operator. And we're gonna do that by working with eigenspaces. Okay, so we've proved uh, that uh, every complex operator has an eigenvalue. So that's gonna be our starting spot. So let's let lambda be, let's go back to the black text here. Let's let lambda be an eigenvalue of an operator T in L of V. Let's not, let's be more careful with our logic. Let's let T be an operator on V and let's let lambda be an eigenvalue of t. These are guaranteed to exist. We proved that last time. Um, and then we're actually going to let uh, a subspace u be equal to the range of t minus lambda i. Now, I know that the dimension of u is going to be less than the dimension of v, because t minus lambda i is not a surjective map. It can't be surjective because um, uh, it's a it's an operator, and there's something in its null space, right? Because I'm, this is the sort of there's something in the null space because I've picked an eigenvalue. So the dimension of U must be less than the dimension of V because um, t minus lambda i is not surjective and this follows by the linear uh, linear the fundamental theorem for linear maps and the theorem that we had that said that if uh, something has a null if an operator has a null space then it can't be surjective right to fail to be injective is also to fail to be surjective um, okay, so then um, uh, we can see that uh, U is invariant under T, and um, one way to do that is we can let u be an element of u, and that means that uh, t applied to u can be chopped up into t minus lambda i times u plus lambda u. Um, clearly, uh, we have that u is in the range, sorry, on the one hand, this thing right here, whatever this vector is, is in U because U was the range of that, right? Since U is equal to the range of T minus lambda I, obviously T minus lambda I, no, that's not right. T minus lambda I U is in U. It's by definition, right? It's comes out of t minus lambda i, so it must be in the range of it. OK, on the other hand, um, u is a subspace. And so lambda u must also be of u. And also, lambda u is in u, because range is a subspace. So that means that t u is in u, because it's a linear combination of something that's in u and something else that's in U. The linear combinations of things in U are in U. <laughs> okay, so that means that um, 
T took a vector in U in and um, spit out a vector that's also in U, and that proves that U is invariant under T. Okay, now we have an invariant subspace, and that lets us use the restriction operator that we talked about at the very beginning of class. So we can define the restriction T restricted to you. Um, uh, which is going to be equal to TU for U and U. And T restricted to U is a linear map on U. And the dimension of U is smaller than the dimension of V. And that means that we can apply our induction hypothesis not to T, but to the restriction of T. So that is to say, by the induction hypothesis, there exist vectors u1 up to um, a basis for u, so that the matrix of t restricted to u is upper triangular. Okay, now that means if that matrix is upper triangular, then I have uh, a certain condition that I can apply from the previous theorem. So what, what, what can we do? Well, if I have this upper triangular matrix, it means I can go back up here to the theorem that we laid out. And that means I get this equivalence. As soon as I have an upper triangular matrix, I also know that the TVJs are in the span of the V1s through VJs for all J. And I know, um, that these uh, span sets are also invariant under T. So that's the theorem we're going to invoke now. So because that matrix was upper, because that matrix was upper triangular, now I can say um, for each J, um, uh, from one up to M, it must be the case that T U J, remember, which is also equal to T restricted to U of U J, is in the span of U1 up to U J. So we have that theorem. OK, so we're most of the way towards an upper triangular matrix right now. And so now we have to extend the basis is the idea. We're going to take this, which is a basis for U, and we're going to extend it to a basis for all of V. And we're going to hope that we can maintain this condition so that we can assume we've got an upper triangular matrix. So extend U1 up to UM to a basis for V. Now we have the following. Um, so I guess that means we're going to have u1 up to um, comma v1 up to vn. I don't know how long the extension is going to be, uh, but there's some number of vectors, right? So this is our basis for v. Now we have the following. Um, for each k, and these k's are going to run the, we're going to run the v vectors now. So for each k uh, going from 1 up to n, we can say the following. T v k is equal to t minus lambda i v k plus lambda v k. By the definition of u, which is the range of t minus lambda i, this thing is in u. Which is equal to the span of u1 up to um. And essentially what this statement is saying is that we've got then 
a piece that is spanned by U1 through UM, and then one more piece of the basis, which is just the VK vector. That means that this thing right here, this guy, is in the span of V1 up to VK. And so what that means is that TVK is in the span of U1 up to UM, V1 up to VK, and that that statement holds for all K. And so since this holds for all K, then we can go back and we can use this same theorem up here again, right? Remember that what this theorem said was that if it was the case that condition B held, then we can conclude that the so matrix is upper triangular. And so that's what we've done. We finished a basis, we started with a basis for U, we extended it to a basis for V, and then we used the fact that T is structured the way that it's structured and this very carefully chosen subspace U. Um, so we're now about to conclude that the matrix of T with respect to the basis U1 up to UM, V1 up to VN is upper triangular. Okay, so this is kind of a complicated argument in terms of the, the pieces. Um, I would hope that you guys would take the time to read it. Um, try to follow the, um, the big moves here are, you know, don't get lost in the details. The big moves here are, we use the eigenvector to get ourselves the subspace um, the, to construct this, uh, this range operator, right? The fact that the eigenvalue exists gave us this invariant subspace. The invariant subspace, which is going to have smaller degree um, allowed us to apply the um, theorem about square matrices to it. That gave us a basis of the right shape. And then we used that basis, we extended it, and that gave us the sort of stacked spanning condition that we needed to conclude that the matrix was upper triangular. So when you're reading a theorem like this, and a, when you're the proof of a theorem like this, it's important not just to follow the line by line argument, but also the sort of big ideas that are going on. So one thing that you might try when you're reading this argument on your own is to try to outline the big steps in here. So the line by line argument is how you get from one big step to the next one. But it's important to be able to identify the big pieces of, of what the argument is built from. And um, yeah, so we'll talk about this again in class, I'm sure. But I'd like people to hopefully you guys take the time to read this. Um, this is kind of a big deal theorem that uh, operators can always be represented with upper triangular matrices. And one of the, the core things that makes linear algebra so useful. All right, uh, see you guys next week.